Okay, one of the things that when it came to Cynthia Williams' death, um, it hit me pretty hard. It still does. Uh, I can't wait to get over there to see her family. But in her death, it stirred up some thoughts that I never really thought about before in any specific way. And the question that came to my mind was, it's a, this, is, was there a time that mankind did not exist? That he was nothing? That there was no existence, there was no nothing? And then we begin to understand that God had a plan. Way before he refurbished the earth. And there was a reason for refurbishing the earth, was it not? Because when you read in the first chapter, where it talks about the creation, giving of the light, the seas, and the sort of thing, and actually preparing the earth for something. And we come to find, of course, there was the Garden of Eden. And this was all prepared. And then something very, very special happened. And in Genesis 2, verse, verse, 7, verse 7, he said, Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breast of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. What happened there? All of a sudden, we're in existence. Mankind came from nothing. Not even, I don't even know how to explain it because my mind can't conceive of what nothing is. Before we were, mankind was created, I can't grasp a hold of the absolutely nothing. But the thoughts go goes much further in the sense that he created Eve. He created a companion for him. Adam was male, we understand that, and Eve was female. And what was the, one of the things that God said to them? Be fruitful and multiply. Because this led me back again to Cynthia, as well as the rest of us. There was a time when each and every one of us were what? Non-existence. You weren't. You, you were non-existence. And I don't know the mind, the way it works. But it's through the union of a husband and wife that a child is born. That child just came into existence from nothing. It's, it's an act of creation. Procreation is actually an act of creation. But that is the way that God designed it. That's why he said be fruitful and multiply. To bring you into existence. From non-existence to existence. And this was a thought that took me to Cynthia. In the time that I have known her. That... She existed. She lived a physical life. She, her spirit was so warm. When she, you know, she could meet us. And I remember the very first time I met her. I, I felt connected to her. Because of her openness and friendliness. And like I said, she treated me like a son. And of course she had her advice and things like that. And that's where I thought that, okay... There was a time when she didn't exist. So I go back to what was God planning here? Okay, you had the garden. Of course, the error that Adam made that brought this age upon us, which is related to all our troubles, the world troubles and things of this nature. But we had to live through it. 
and we still do. There's a purpose there, and we know that God had a plan. He created us for a purpose. And I sit there and go, I, I understand, I agree. But how many other people do they understand our purpose on why we were created and how it came about? Because then if there was a time, we didn't exist. And I found in 1 John 3, verse 3, it says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we would be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will shall see him as he really is. The plan. I, you know, I'm still trying to grasp this idea. Non-existent to existent, a plan was put in place. <laughs> For us. And it's only, you know, a few, you know, because like God says, you know, many are chosen. I mean, I'm sorry, many are called, but few are chosen. And of course, that will lead you right back to the parable of the sower. And it's understandable. As you read through it, you begin to understand because you know people saying, okay, you started out good, but you didn't last long. Or you just, you know, that nature. But those that fell on the good ground, is that part of God's eternal plan? Of what he already had planned before anything came into existence? And we know and understand that all things that were created came through Christ. It's trying to grasp and understand who we really are and what our future is. You know, it's odd that a death would make me think in these terms. But they're terms that we should be thinking in and understanding who God is and why he has done what he's done. Because where do we actually end up? In uh, Revelation 20, verse 5, it says, This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Does that kind of take you way back? I mean, this is where it was linking up with my thoughts of non-existence to existence for a purpose, a very real purpose, knowing and understanding God is creating a family, and it's in us. And when Christ returns, those chosen ones will serve with Christ, bring the peace back, Bring God's law and righteousness to this earth. And the one thing that I really love and that I think a lot about now, because I read the last um, good news, which was the biblical view, world view, where it was talking about the banishment of Satan and his demons. Those that are resurrected with Christ will actually see that. But the point is that source of all the evil, the source of all the trouble, what we're seeing today in today's world, the things that are going on in this country, the things that are going on in the world, the wars, there's more coming. And these diseases are beginning to pop up. Ones that we thought we had under control all of a sudden back. We understand 
and in that reading it talks about Satan knows. He has a very short time. And in that, there's going to be wrath. There's going to be these troubles. The world will not understand. But the gift that we have through the Holy Spirit is we do understand. We do know what's ahead of us, do we not? Does that not strengthen your faith? Because I hear, you know, like at work, I hear these people... They talk about things. Uh, there's, there's one employee there that we have lunch together. And we talk about these things. And she has, she's not a member of the church, but she has an understanding of these demonic influence and how these world events are being shaped and pushed towards a goal. That's kind of refreshing. Because I, 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 I go, it's good that you know this. But the question is, where do you go from here? When things start going bad, things start getting difficult, where is your faith going to be? Is it strong enough to see you through? We know trouble's coming, and it's not going to be good. It's going to be difficult. But God says he will protect us. He will take care of us. Now what that means, I don't know. Because when the trouble comes, the trouble comes. I don't question it, I'm just asking myself by looking into the face of reality, how, what's coming, okay, is the strength there? That strength can only come from the Holy Spirit. It can only come from your closeness to God. Can't come from anywhere else. But it's just knowing his plan. In the holy days, because I look at those holy days, you know, they're, and in their meaning. And we're getting ready to, to begin it in April with Passover, where, where the cycle starts again. But it's through the Holy Spirit and your understanding that you understand that plan. Because most people, they go, those are Jewish holidays. They don't mean anything to me. They mean everything to us. Because it spells it out. But see, it, once again, it takes me back to before anything was created. This plan that brought us into existence for a very specific purpose, which we see in the book of Revelation. When we're changed, you get to the great white throne judge, you get through that, and then God descends into New Jerusalem, and we actually live with him. At that moment, what comes to your mind? Because it came to mind. At that moment, when that happens, Physical human beings will no longer exist. That kind of make you think a little bit? Before, you know, before we were in non-existence, we came into existence for a very specific purpose, to be the spirit beings in living with God. But understanding the physical phase of it ends. Now we don't know what comes in the future. But it's just these thoughts. You know, and I think of Cynthia. Yes, she's not alive. You know, we usually say she's asleep or she's just simply dead. But I know and we know in our hearts when the first resurrection comes, she will be there. And hopefully we will too. So knowing and having that comfort knowing she will be alive. I will see her again. Yes, the physical death is, is it's grievous. It is, and I understand that. But knowing I will see her again. That is a blessing. 
to know that those that are chosen, those that we have gone to church with for all our lives, we will see them again. What a beautiful thing. Well, my question is, who put all of that in motion? God did. We, you know, you sit there and think, we're a very special creation. Because it, it is written that it says, the crown of creation, that's who we are. But one of the things that I've come to understand, and it's, it's written, um, our physical lives are actually no different than animal life. You know, the, the physical laws that control physical life also apply to us. Except there is one difference. Our intelligence, our spirit, the way that God blessed it and the abilities that he gave it. The animal kingdom doesn't have that. But yet we're subject to the same laws that control physical life. I mean, all you gotta do is sit down, and think about it, and it'll come to you. Yes, we live, we're born, we live, we die, as Solomon says, time to season. It's the beauty of God's thoughts. So they are so much higher than ours on how he put all this together and how it applies to us. How many people really truly understand the first resurrection and what's going to take place there? What it takes to get there? You understand these things because you have chosen to and you live by it and you understand the promise. Just like the special music, Promise Keeper. He, what he promised, he will do. We know that. But my question comes then, do you have faith in that? Do you truly understand the promise? And what it means to you? Especially your future. Because just think, I mean, just... You know, I'm an older man, I understand that I'm past my three score and ten. Uh, <laughs> my day is coming. But I think about that moment when Jesus Christ returns. I'm standing next to him. I'm seeing him as he is. That supersedes everything. Because I've always fantasized, you know, like I said, okay, if I had the ability to go back in time, where would I want to be? I would want to be when Jesus Christ's ministry began. I would want to be there from the moment it began to his ascension into heaven. That's always been a fantasy of mine. Not realizing I'd be... <laughs> I would, well, hopefully I would understand the language <laughs> and not speak English. But I, I think about that and then I begin, then I realize that, Jeff, there is a day coming where you won't be physical, you'll be changed. He will be right there before you. A priest and a king, you have a job to do. But you're hand in hand with Jesus Christ. That to me makes death, it lo death loses its sting there. Okay, like Paul was talking about, oh death, where is your victory? Because knowing and believing and having that trust and faith, that promise to be there with him. It overrules everything. It's life to know that, to believe it. But more than believing it, knowing that it will happen. So yes, I have to suffer the things of this world, this physical being, the aches, the pains, the exposures, the possible death by cancer or something of this nature, or 
a debilitating stroke. If it happens, it happens. But that has always been my desire that God have mercy. If something of that degree happened to me, let me fall asleep. Because I'll be with you, I'll be honest with you with Cynthia, when I heard about the level of her stroke, knowing that it was her second one. Of course, in your prayers, you always ask for an intervention to cure her. But I was also in the position of saying, don't let her suffer. Don't let her suffer. Just let her go to sleep. Two days later, I, be, I became aware of her death. I was very thankful. And I thank God for that, that he heard that, please, don't let her suffer. And I feel that way about a lot of, you know, the prayer requests that I see. You read some of them, you go, this is not good. Don't let them suffer. And I know with, with some, it, it grieves me to see someone, let's say like from a stroke, and they're, they're disabled, you know. What quality of life do they have? And that's where I ask God, please, don't let that happen. Just let her go. And it happened that way. Because I know my mother, she was in a nursing home. And um, I visit her at least twice a week, once a week. <sighs> Nursing home taught me some things about human life, physical life, in the sense that I saw people there that no one came to visit them. That's kind of sad. But it was their quality of life that I kind of focused on. And it's like, why? You know, of course, the medical institution will do everything to keep them alive, and that's what was going on. That grieved me. I said, this should not be. But, unfortunately, it is. Now, when it came to my mother, she was 92. She had better eyes, hearing, teeth, limber than me. But, fortunately, she declined rather quickly, and I, and I was glad to see that. It really was. But those are experiences we have and that we have understanding. And my younger brother, I had to make a decision. Either he lives or he dies. But I've known my younger brother for so long. And his pain, his suffering, and the mental illness that he had for many, many years, he, his quality of life was nothing. He couldn't do anything. He had to have a carekeeper. And uh, he developed an esophageal mass. And uh, they came to me since I was next kin and said, we can tube him. We can put him on life support. I, did, I looked at him and I says, please don't consider me cruel. But you're not going to do that. I'm going to let him go. Actually, what surprised me is the doctor and the nurses actually thanked me for the decision I made. But I look at the fact, we we'll go back when we come to the resurrections, I will see them again. And if they have questions about what happened to them physically, I will tell them. But I'm the sole survivor of the family. They're gone. I look forward to that day when I can sit down, talk to them, explain to them what happened, and that their beliefs, the beliefs they had in the afterlife were false. I look forward to that. But those days are coming. I mean, there, there's plenty to deal with now. I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of still shaken over Cynthia's death because uh, it brings so many thoughts back you know, about the things that we believe. Because what it reveals is the strength in those beliefs, the strength in the faith of knowing 
what's in the future and the part we have in it. And I think about our friends, our loved ones. We'll be there to help them when their time comes. And that's why I find it to be so important for us to know and understand these things and to be ready for it. You know, do you live in this world still or do you live in the millennium? I personally live in the millennium. Understanding, yes, you're still physical and you're still subject to those laws. But my heart and my thoughts are in the millennium. I don't know if yours are or not, but I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Of what's ahead of us. That once again, that takes me back to when we were non-existent. God had this plan. He created this earth for us to live. And also gave us a hand in what? Procreation. I think about that with my daughters, you know. It came through the way God had created things. That my daughters at one time were non-existent. They exist now. They have a future. Such a blessing. He really and truly is. But I just want to make the point that you understand the gift that you have, that you understand the future that is before you. And the question becomes, does it have any worth to you? Is it something that, I sort of believe it, but I need to stay here a little longer to find out if I really do? You should know. This world means nothing. It's the world to come that means everything. So brethren, keep those thoughts and make it your life mission to be there when Jesus Christ returns.